Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I'm Jean-Luc Lenas. I would like to um, tell you a little bit about quantum cosmology and in particular about the, the path integral framework for quantum cosmology. Um, so one, okay, so first it, it, it's maybe useful to go back briefly to about a hundred years ago when it wasn't even clear that, you know, that we had many galaxies in the universe. Uh, there were stars and nebulae observed, but it wasn't clear what the nebulae really were. Many people thought they were just solar or star systems in formation, which happened to be true for some of them, but not all of them. Um, and only when, when Slipher started measuring the velocities of these, and later Hubble uh, with more precision, uh, it became clear that, that these nebulae cannot all be within our galaxy, right? So then the picture emerged that in fact these are separate galaxies and um so you know the our view of the universe changed completely at that moment because suddenly there was you know not just one entity in the universe but but many different galaxies moreover then the picture became clear that the universe is expanding because these these galaxies are all receding from us and they're receding faster the further they are away so at that moment it was clear that the universe is not a static entity and so therefore it must have had a history and if it has a history we're trying to figure out what that history was now also if it has a history that means that there there were some special conditions in the beginning um, and because everything evolved from these special conditions now we at in the standard big bang model that's simply the big bang um, and we don't, this, this model does not give us any way of characterizing these initial conditions. Um, they are just put in by hand. Now, we do know from the CMB, for instance, that the initial conditions must have been very special. So, for instance, we know that at the time that the CMB was emitted, that the universe was very highly isotropic, homogeneous, that it was spatially flat, but with these additional small perturbations. I mean, we're all very well aware of this. Um, but what what this this begs the question of you know are these initial conditions somehow random um, are they typical or are they special I mean the question is really was the universe forced to start in this way with these special conditions or was or maybe are there many universes and this is just one possibility out of many and if so, then we would still like to know what is the probability for the universe starting in the way that we see it. Um, certainly what's so, clear is that uh, the conditions John, are... John, I have one yes. question. Yes. Yeah. So I just want to ask that since you were mentioning about the initial condition, mm -hmm. so like when uh, so people do this, uh, study this kind of inflation and such certain kind of possibilities. So yes. what people assume at the starting point of inflation? Is it like uh, very like um, uh, people uh, ad hoc introduce this or there is some problem with that? Um, I'm, I'm getting to that in a minute, but um, yes, I will, I will answer that in a minute. Okay, okay, um, sure. Yeah, so different, so, so the, the thing is that, you know, the, the, um, the thinking about this question has changed over time. And in particular, when inflation came along, um, mm -hmm. the, 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 the way people thought about the initial conditions changed, especially with the idea of, of chaotic inflation. Because the idea with chaotic inflation is that um, there can be different conditions in different places. You know, in a sense, initially, there could be all possible conditions in different regions of the universe. There would just be some random distribution of, of mm -hmm. say, curvatures, of densities, whatever. And, and it's enough that somewhere the conditions are right for inflation to start. So somewhere the universe is sufficiently flat and sufficiently isotropic to, and homogeneous to, to allow inflation to actually uh, start. And then inflation blows up that region enormously. And then even after a little bit of time, just a short amount of time, almost all of the actual of, of the volume of the universe is in this inflationary state. Now, that was the idea of chaotic inflation. Um, and so if that was true, then 
in a sense, the question of initial conditions becomes less relevant because um, it would be would be saying that no matter what the initial almost no matter what the initial conditions were, somewhere inflation will start and will take over. Um, however, we know from the observations of the Planck satellite, for instance, that and I mean, from the non-observation of gravitational waves, we know that the, the energy scale of, of inflation must have been at least five orders of magnitude below the Planck scale. And if that's the case, you see then, then this argument of having random conditions at the beginning of the universe, which would mean at the Planck scale, does not really, does not, does not work. Right? There is no, um, you have to then explain how you still get to the con correct conditions so many orders of magnitude below the Planck scale. And it's not typically true that if you just evolve a generic configuration, I mean, what happens is that the, the kinetic energy of the scalar field is still, is actually um, typically large. And uh, this is difficult to, it's difficult to obtain conditions in which the kinetic energy of the scalar field is small enough to allow inflation to start. And so there is no particular, it's not known to what extent this picture could still work that, that with generic emission conditions, inflation would take over. Now, um, you see, the idea of eternal inflation is also then that everything gets produced and that, you know, different regions of the universe evolve into different late final configurations and there can be quantum fluctuations that change the physics in different regions of the universe. And so you make all possibilities and then if you want to make any predictions, you have to use a measure. But whenever people have tried to use measures in eternal inflation, it always le led to paradoxes. So, and also I should say that really eternal inflation is, is based on, on quantum physics because the idea is that, you know, inf inflation will not end because the, the scalar field can jump up to potential, which is a quantum transition. Um, and this is not uh, usually taken into account in, in these measures the fact that there are also quantum processes. Uh, and so I think this is we, an incomplete story at the moment that we don't really understand yet. Uh, Arnold had any question? Yeah, actually, might seem trivial, but you just mentioned paradoxes. Like, what kind of paradoxes? I mean, first of all, why can it lead to paradox and what kind of paradoxes? Um, so... It, it depends. There, there are two big general classes of measures that people have looked at. Basically, one class of measures is is just trying to measure by volume, by the volume of space that, that is produced by inflation. And if you do that, you prefer those regions which produce the largest volume. But the regions which produce the largest volume are those in which the uh, scalar field stays high up on the potential for as long as possible and then has a quantum uh, jump down at, right at the end. And so you would then um, predict that the universe is, is our universe would be as young as possible um, because if you stay longer in the inflationary phase, you make more volume. So you would predict that actually you stay in the inflationary phase much longer and then so have a very quick um, uh, jump down the potential. And so the, basically when you, when you put numbers in and you calculate this, you see that, that the probability for the universe to be even one second younger than it actually is, is extremely much higher than, than the probability that it is as old as it is. So it's, I mean, and there's no, nothing that says that the universe could not have been one second younger. <laughs> um, and so basically this is, that's the paradox. Now, the other class of measures is where you don't measure volume, but you follow world lines of observers and you measure how many times life can occur along a particular world line. But this also leads to paradoxes because if you have two vacua, so two two regions in your potential which are close by and, and have vacua, you can, you can tunnel from one to the other and back, back and forth. And you would always predict that you are in, in, in those vacua in which you can tunnel back and forth as quickly as possible. Because this is, um, because you don't, 
you don't count. You know, what counts is, is how many times along a particular world line you would be in a, in a certain vacuum. And if you go back and forth between vacua, then you enter a new vacuum very often. And this would again be, be preferred. So these are a little bit, these are the, the main classes of measures that people have looked at. And um, they, they never lead to re, uh, results that are in agreement with what we see in the universe. So, uh, so I think this isn't, yeah, our understanding of this is incomplete. Another uh, completely different framework is given by cyclic models, where you say, well, um, the universe uh, has, has phases of expansion and contraction in alternation. And then the, the conditions, then the condition, con question of initial conditions, in a sense, disappears, because the conditions one cycle ago would be the same as now. Uh, but on the other hand, you're also not, not really explaining them, right? Because you are introducing a circular argument. And so, so you are not really explaining why the universe is as it is. There is one elaboration on this, pic one, one possible way in which this picture can work better is if the, the bounce, so the transition from the contracting phase to the expanding phase, if, if this acts as a filter, so if not if it's not true that the entire universe bounces, but only, say, flat regions, sufficiently flat regions, then uh, you would have a way of explaining why the universe is flat, right? Because you would select these regions. So if the bounce can act as a filter, it could filter out the, the, the appropriate initial conditions. But uh, I should say that this is just an idea at the moment, and there are no, no good concrete models which show how this could work because we don't really understand bounces very well yet. Um, so all these things le le you know, have many open questions uh, associated to them. But um, plus there's another, I should mention another uh, puzzle of the early universe, which is the entropy puzzle. The entropy puzzle is, is due to Roger Penrose, and it says that the observed entropy in radiation in the universe, in, in, so for example in the CMB, is given by something like 10 to the 87. Um, and this is just the entropy of the CMB. And, but you see, um, the entropy in, in, uh, in black holes in, in the centers of galaxies, for instance, is much higher. It's more on the order of 10 to the 100. And if you were, if you use the thought experiment that you would put all the mass in the observable part of the universe into one black hole, that black hole would have an entropy of about 10 to the 120. So really, the entropy in the, in the early universe, um, when there was just the radiation, was really very low. You know, it was, um, you know, many, many orders of magnitude smaller than, than the potential uh, maximal entropy that, that we could have had. So really, the, one, one has to explain why the entropy was so low in the early universe. And this is also required for the second law of thermodynamics to work, because the second law says that the entropy always grows, but that means that it must have been small initially. And so one must be able to explain why it was small initially. Um, so all of these things show that we, we, we don't the dynamics of the early I mean, that the dynamics of the early universe is not enough to, to explain uh, the initial conditions. And so really also what I should point out that, that classically there is no, not much hope for finding such an explanation because classically everything is time reversal invariant and, and you cannot really um, find a good way of, 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 of assigning probabilities to different um, starting point. So what we really need is a, is a quantum theory of initial conditions. And that's the, one of the main goals of quantum cosmology to, to, to set up such quantum theories of initial conditions or to try out quantum theories of initial conditions. Now, there are other questions associated to this subject, which are, you know, already the conceptual question of how do we apply quantum theory to the entire universe? Then also, how did the early universe become classical? Because really, we have no particular reason for thinking that, for assuming that it was classical immediately. You know, if, if, if a certain quantum process allowed the universe to come into existence, then the universe started out in some quantum state. And it's not obvious that it should look classical. Um, 
and then related to that is the question of how did space, time, and matter actually arise? So I will um, talk a little bit about the framework of using path integrals in quantum cosmology, where some of these questions can be framed in, in sort of in toy models. I should say from the outset that all of all the, the applications so far are always uh, for toy models where one restricts the, the number of degrees of freedom in the universe. Hello, John. Uh, yes. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yes, the question is, can you run through the argument of this entropy again? I, I, I possibly I have missed it. So can we just go through the argument which was proposed by Pandos, as we have mentioned? Yes. So can we just go through that? Yes. Yes. So you can calculate the entropy that's in, in the CMB, just the entropy in the radiation. Um, and this is uh, comes out to be of order 10 to the 87. Yeah. Um, and in, in Boltzmann, you know, setting Boltzmann's constant to one. Okay. And um, and well, that was the entropy. The entropy in the CMB is conserved, but in the early universe, that was all there was, right? So that was so there was just this entropy in the early universe, 10 to the 87. But actually, if you would put all the mass that's in the universe into a black hole, the entropy would be 10 to the 120, which is much, much higher. So this means that um, the entropy in the early universe was comparatively small. And this is one of the things that it would be nice to be able to explain. Because if the, you know, it's also fundamental to the way our, our universe functions because the second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy always grows, but it can only grow if it was, if it was small initially. Um, because you see that we, we, from black hole thermodynamics, we think that the, if you put matter into a black hole, that's the maximum entropy you can get. So yeah. this 10 to the 120 is in a sense maximum entropy. Uh, and so... That, that means that if, if this was, a, for instance, if this was a completely random process, how the universe got, got created, you would ex expect the entropy to have been close to this 10 to the 120 initially. But actually, it was much smaller. And so that there needs to be some explanation for why it was so small. Um, okay, so, so let me continue with uh, just see what... So the, that we will do here is just to use general relativity. Um, one would expect later on, of course, that there would be corrections to general relativity. Uh, uh, so, for example, terms of the form uh, Riemann to higher powers, Riemann tensor to higher powers. But as long as the curvatures are not too high, in fact, as long as the curvatures remain below the Planck scale, typically GR should still be a, a reasonably good approximation. So I will, for this talk, I will just stick to pure GR. And then one can just try to see what happens if you try to quantize GR directly. So um, in a sense, this is just semi-classical quantization. So this would not be, not be string theory uh, or loop quantum gravity or whatever, but, but it will, it's a, just a direct semi-classical quantization of gravity, which actually should presumably be recovered in a limit in the in more fundamental quantum gravity approaches in any case. So what we want to calculate in, you know, in quantum mechanics, what you calculate is if a particle goes from point A to point B, you sum over all the paths that are in between A and B. And each path is weighted by, by the action. So it gets a phase factor, which is given by, by the action of that path. And this is how you calculate the quantum amplitude in quantum mechanics. Now, if you do this in quantum gravity, what, we're really, what you're really calculating is not a transition amplitude between two points, but between two three-dimensional hypersurfaces. So in a sense, you can think of this as configurations of the universe at a particular time. Um, and you calculate a transition amplitude by summing over all the four geometries that link the initial and the final um, surfaces at, at specified times. Now, um, I'm saying at a specified time, but really the time interval between these two surfaces will only be determined by the amplitude that you calculate. So it's not really an input. Um, so what I'm saying, often the way this is done is to use, to set up the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, 
and um, which is an analogous or uh, which is a similar way of, of, of setting up quantum cosmology. But uh, the path integral, auto by construction, yields a solution of the Wheeler DeWitt equation. And so, but in a sense, the path integral is e is is better suited to this this uh, issue of boundary conditions. Um, because the wheeler DeWitt equation by itself does not tell you anything about boundary conditions, but in the path integral, it's very easy, as we will see, to specify boundary conditions. Now, okay, so um, from this, let me maybe say, before we do any calculations, what the main, the main theory of boundary conditions is the no, no boundary proposal. So let me maybe briefly say what the idea of that proposal is. So what I was just saying is we... In quantum cosmology with the path integral, you calculate transition amplitude between two spatial hypersurfaces. One would be considered to be now, and the other one would be considered to be in the early universe, or maybe at the beginning of the universe. But the question is, what conditions should one impose at the beginning? And if you impose some conditions, then, you know, there can always have been something that happened before. And the idea of Hartland Hawking was to say, well, what if we just eliminate this initial hypersurface completely? Then we only have the final hypersurface. There's no boundary surface on the initial time. And therefore, there is nothing that happened before. Um, and so in this sense, you, the no boundary proposal would be describing the creation of the universe from nothing. So from the complete absence of space and time. But you can only make the geometry, a four geometry, um, you can only round off a four geometry if that geometry is Euclidean. You cannot do it with a Lorentzian geometry, otherwise you will get a singularity. Uh, but our whole, whole idea here is to avoid singularities and to be able to, to explain the Big Bang. And so with a Euclidean part of the geometry, you can round this off, and in fact you can then replace the Big Bang by this uh, rounded off geometry. Okay, so in, to say this, how this could work a bit more explicitly is if you look at the metric for the sitter space, um, the scale factor is given by cosh t. This is the sitter space closed slicing where each spatial section is a three-dimensional sphere. Now, you can use analytic continuation in the time coordinate. So t is minus i tau, and then there's also an offset by i pi over two. And this gives you the metric on a four-dimensional sphere. And so you can see that by using analytic continuation of the geometry, of certain geometries, you can get a geometry which is in fact smooth and rounded off, like the four sphere. And so this is the idea that actually at the, that this rounding off of the geometry looks a bit like, like a, a part of a four-dimensional sphere. Now, Okay, so now we should try and just apply this to gravity and actually do do a calculation of these path integrals. So we will take the the the, the theory to consist of just Hilbert gravity and the cosmological constant lambda. We would then want to sum over all possible all space times that interpolate between two specified um, initial and final uh, surfaces. Now. There was always a problem with this because people, in analogy with quantum field theory, people always thought it was best to, to calculate such a path integral using Euclidean metrics, so using Euclidean quantum gravity, um, because they were hoping that this would make the path integral more convergent. However, the, this immediately, when you have gravity, this leads to the conformal mode problem. So the kinetic term for gravity has the opposite sign to the kinetic term of, of matter. Not the kinetic. I said the kinetic term for gravity, but really what I mean is the kinetic term for the scale of for the scale factor of the universe has a, a different sign from the kinetic term for for matter fields, such as a scalar field. And so, actually, this you were hoping to make the path integral a Gaussian integral, but then the part related to the scale factor will be an inverse Gaussian and will will be divergent. And so this does not really work. Then, uh, but if you want to ca evaluate the Lorentzian path integral, you don't have this problem because you're just summing over phases. However, the trouble is that this is only a conditionally convergent integral, 
because the modulus of the path integral is one. And so you don't know, it's not completely clear what it, whether it will converge and what it will converge to. Now, in order to do that, there's a nice uh, mathematical framework which one can use, which is called picard lefschetz theory. And the idea of this is that you extend the fields to the complex, to functions of, of uh, to the complex plane. So you make your, your fields complex. The scale factor will be complex, for instance. And the idea is that this is, that you're not changing the integral by doing this, but that you are um, just finding a clever way of evaluating the integral. So the boundary conditions remain the same, but you are allowing the fields in the path integral to be now also complex. And what the advantage of this is that, you know, from Cauchy's theorem, you know that if you have a complex integral, you can shift the contour of integration. And picard lefschetz theory, in a sense, is telling you how you should shift it. Right? There's a. It tells you what what is the optimal way of shifting it. Now. Um, the way it works is that you have to focus on the saddle points of of the integral, and the saddle points of of the full complex integral are also the saddle points of the Morse function little h. Now the Morse function little h is just the is just the real part of um, of the uh, of i s. So you 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 sum over e to the i s, and this complex this phase is now because because the fields in s are now allowed to be complex. This is now a general complex number, and the real part of this is called the Morse function which gives you the amplitude of the integrand, right? And then here, capital H denotes the phase of the integrand. And um, one can show very easily that, that critical points of the Morse function correspond to critical points of the full integrand. So if you look at, at uh, sort of local minima or maxima or saddle points of, of the Morse function, that's, that gives you already all of the critical points of the full in, um, integral. And so the idea is that now, because these are critical points, there are in these, around these, these points, the amplitude of the integral will either go up or down, right? But there will be one direction in which it will go up and then an orthogonal direction in which it will flow down. And so if you look at the region, at this, at the regions in which the amplitude of the integral flows down the, the fastest, this is called the, the path of steepest descent. And this path of steepest descent is the one along which the integral will converge the fastest. So you actually want to, will want to define your integral on these steepest descent paths. Um, the steepest descent paths can be defined via the equation which I have here on this slide that you choose a parameter lambda along the path, and then uh, x is your field. So dx by d lambda for a steepest descent would be given by minus dh by dx. And you need some metric on this, on this uh, configuration space that you are working on. But in, in the cases that we will look at, this will just be the trivial metric. Now, in this case, John, yes. John, yes. Is what this lambda parameter corresponds to? It's just some parameter along the curve of steepest descent. Okay. You, you just it, it just labels that uh, points on that curve. It okay. has no particular it has no particular physical meaning. It's just uh, a way of it's just an affine parameter along the curve. Okay. Now, um, and so one can see with this definition immediately <laughs> below just by, by uh, using the chain rule, that the, this Morse function, little h, is then always either decreasing or increasing along this, these lines, depending on whether you define this to be the steepest descent or steepest ascent curve. Now, I, okay, um, one can rewrite these equations in, in the more, um, uh, by, by using complex numbers, so now the, the field X was complexified into, a, and, and now we call it U. Um, and in fact, well, I think there's no need to, to look at these equations in any detail, but what they show you very quickly is that 
the phase is conserved along such paths of steepest ascent and descent. And that's how you can easily find these paths now in practice. So this means that having a stationary phase path is the same as having a steepest descent or steepest ascent path. And, and this is just how you can, in, in, in practical applications, how you can find this path numerically. Now, um, these, if you have these paths where the integrand is either growing or, or shrinking rapidly, this will um, partition your, your plane of, of, your, of the integral into different regions, regions which asymptotically are convergent, where the integrand becomes smaller and smaller, these are here shown in green, and then um, regions where it's divergent asymptotically, and these are shown in red. And the little arrows which I have on this graph are always showing uh, the direction of descent. So the direction along which the integrand becomes smaller. Um, and so the idea really is that if you start with some highly oscillating integral along some contour C in orange here, so this is an, an you see, this is now an an integral which is highly oscillating and has many cancellations, and so you're not quite sure what it will actually um, uh, converge to. The idea is that you replace this contour C and shift it to a, a con to such a contour of steepest descent, to such a steepest descent path, which is also called a thimble. And along this thimble, you see the integrand now is is roughly has roughly Gaussian shape, and uh, so. So now it's nicely um, convergent. And also, this means that because you know you don't have these cancellations of terms in your integrand, actually the, the, um, the amplitude of the integrand must be smaller than the original amplitude. So what this means is that from your original contour of integration here in C, you have to flow down. So you follow the arrow down to reach a, a path of steepest descent that is relevant to your integral. Um, this is something that I I have uh, just written on this transparency in formulae, but it's exactly what I was just saying. What this means is that really, in the end, the origin you can re-express the original integral as a sum over integrals over these Lefschetz thimbles, so over these paths of steepest descent. And moreover, since these paths are paths of stationary phase, of constant phase, you can take the phase out of the integral. And, and then um, this becomes a sum of manifestly convergent integrals. So this is a way of, of rewriting a conditionally convergent integral in, as a sum of absolutely convergent integrals. And so this allows you to actually evaluate these integrals. Now let me give you an example. Uh, as an example, one can take the area function which is uh, which can be defined as the integral over dx of e to the i x cubed over three plus phi x, and um, this is the area function of phi of the argument phi. So now to evaluate this using picard lefschetz theory, one would first try to look at the critical points. So we would look at the at the um, local minima or maxima of this function x cubed over three plus phi x. But you can see immediately by the, taking a derivative with respect to x that the critical points are given by x being plus or minus i square root of phi. But then the question is, do these, do these saddle points now both contribute to the integral or not? And this depends on, on the argument. So here I give you an example where it's the area function of e to the i pi over 3. Then one has, these, one has two um, saddle points. If the integral is defined along the real line, um, then one has to see how you know one has to shift this line by following the arrows of descent. So the arrows point up from this line, and so really what this means is that we have to shift this line up to the steepest descent path that passes through the saddle point in the upper half plane. And so now one can immediately use this to estimate the value of the area function at this, at uh, with the argument e to the i pi by three, and um, because you can now just, you know that the main contribution will come from this saddle point. And there's only one saddle point that's, that's relevant. Okay, so this is a way of, of um, systematically evaluating such oscillating integrals. Now, I should say one more thing. 
about the physical interpretation of such saddle points. And that is that typically if you find a real saddle point where all of the fields are real, this corresponds to a classical solution of the equations of motion. And so this is just classical physics. If you find a saddle point which is at complex values of, of, the, uh, of the fields, then, the, then this is still a, a solution of the classical equations of motion, but it's a complex solution of the classical equations of motion. And this can be interpreted then as describing a quantum process. So this is giving you something which classically is not allowed, but nevertheless will give a dominant contribution to the path integral. Uh, so, now, yes. Uh, just uh, maybe a very big question, but this, as you are talking about this uh, complex saddle point, so yep. like you can think of like some amplitude and some phase. So, is that amplitude is uh, exactly equal to the classical one? Uh, so, if it's a purely classical solution, then uh, the action will still be real, and so it will be a pure phase. You know, because you integrate over e to the i s for mm -hmm. the Lorentzian path integral, and so then you will get a pure, purely a phase. Okay. And if it's a complex saddle point, you will get a non-trivial amplitude and a non-trivial phase, typically. Okay. okay. Uh, in fact, the phase. So, in a th in a sense, you can think of the phase being associated with classical evolution, and the and the amplitude. Also, I mean, let's or let's say it differently. Changes in the phase are associated with classical evolution, changes in the amplitude are associated with quantum processes. Uh, uh, John, uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. Yes. So you just mentioned that the real saddle point corresponds to classical physics and complex saddle point corresponds to quantum physics. Yes. So how, how does this two point reconcile with the basic ideas of classical and quantum physics? Means how does this going from real to complex phases changes the view from classical to quantum? It's, it's very similar. So if you think of the WKB approximation in quantum mechanics, then um, okay. if, you have, uh, if you have a, um, or take a simple example where you look at tunneling. So you have a potential barrier and you have a, a particle which comes in which has an energy which is smaller than the height of the barrier. Right. As long as it's outside of the barrier, it oscillates Right, so, so this means it has a rapidly changing phase. Right. And here we just said, and this is basically the classical region, and this is the same here. A real saddle point gives classical physics and it gives a, just a phase that changes. So it, because of e to the i s will be a pure phase. And, but now if you're under the, the, the barrier where you're tunneling, then um, when you're tunneling, you are... Um, uh, your wave function is exponential. Right. So that means that e to the i s now is an exponential, which means s must be complex or imaginary, right? Right. Uh, and so this again means that you must have a complex saddle point. Okay. So it's really the same thing. Um, if it, it's 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 sort of a generalization of this basic idea from from quantum mechanics. Right. And then if you have more than one saddle point that's relevant, this would correspond to interference. So if you were to study the double slit experiment in this framework, you would find two saddle points, one associated with the first slit, one associated with the second slit, and you would sum over both saddle points. Right. And so then sure. this would be an interference. Yes. And uh, so it's, it's not really, I mean, it, this is simply, this is standard physics. I'm just saying that what it looks like in this, in this framework. But it's it's really kind of what you're used to from ordinary quantum mechanics. Um, uh, good. I so also have a question. Yes, sure. Uh, is it like that uh, if we do some analytical continuation of uh, the classical solution, uh, the classical thing, classical saddle point, then can we get the qu complex uh, saddle point from there? This can the happen, yes. Yes, this can happen. But uh, the thing is, as we will see, what matters are the boundary conditions. So you can, if you have a certain solution and you look at the analytic continuation of that solution, that's fine. It's still a solution. But the question is now, what are the appropriate boundary conditions? Because you will typically not need the full solution, but only a part of it. 
And so if the if the boundary conditions are classical boundary conditions, this will sort of just choose this, the classical part of the solution. Whereas if you put in boundary conditions which force the system to do something which classically is impossible, like tunneling, you know, yeah. you say, I want to start on one side of the barrier, but I want to end on the other side of the barrier, then you will automatically choose automatically pick out a part of the analytically continued solution uh -huh. okay right so so you can you can always have a solution and it's analytic continuation but whether which part of it is relevant will depend on the boundary conditions that you choose okay so i uh, i have one more question yes. uh, we were doing a saddle point uh, uh, the gradient descent thing right so it, it yes. was it as a part of the action like so what was it? It actually tells you wh which are the paths of steepest descent. I will show an example now, just now. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, so let's let's try and do this now for gravity and and the cosmological constant. I will choose a, a coordinate system which is such that t runs from zero to one. So the time coordinate runs from zero to one, and that will just interpolate between the initial hypersurface and the final hypersurface. Okay. But um, the metric, it turns out it's useful to use a slightly different metric than the standard Robertson-Walker form, um, where the scale factor squared is called Q, and the time coordinate is a little bit uh, different from the usual one. Um, so there's the lapse function N, which determines then how much time really passes between T equals 0 and 1. And, and also we choose time such that this, this inverse uh, scale factor squared appears in the metric. And this is not because of a physical choice, but this is because this particular choice of time coordinate makes the action quadratic in Q. So the, the action just becomes quadratic in Q, and that makes the calculations very simple. And um, so with this coordinate system, we can now, um, in fact, evaluate the path integral. The idea is that we will we can find immediately, because because it's quadratic in Q, the equation of motion for Q is very simple. It's just that Q, sorry, if I go back, you see immediately the equation of motion is that Q double dot is proportional to lambda. And you can just find the solutions to this, which are just quadratic in time. So now here I've already used boundary conditions, which are such that Q at, is zero on the initial hypersurface because we want to start from zero size of the universe in this case and go to some final size q1 now the idea is that the path the integral over q can be done by shifting variables to q bar plus capital q where this q bar is a solution of the equation of motion and capital q is a fluctuation around this and the trick is that because q bar is a solution which we know explicitly we can just integrate over q bar directly and capital q is a fluctuation, but since the action was quadratic, this is gives simply a Gaussian integral, which can be done exactly. And so one can just do the integral over Q, over the scale factor squared, and one find one is left with an with an integral only over the lapse function n. So one can so the action, which has already been in evaluated now by by uh, doing the integral over Q becomes a function of n alone. And this, this integral now is a complicated oscillating integral. And for that, to, to evaluate that integral, we can use picard lefschetz theory that we just talked about. So in order to use it, we have to again look at the saddle points now of this integrand. And the saddle points are just given by four, there are four saddle points which are given here by, uh, and they're called ns. Okay, and these are all complex, and this is because making the universe start at zero size is classically not allowed, right? So that's why we get saddle points which are complex. From this, we already know that we're going to be able, we're going to describe a quantum process here. Um, so now one can numerically find the paths of steepest descent around these four saddle points, which are where these lines cross. Um, let me just show you. A graph which has more more details. So there are four saddle points: one, two, three, four. Here at these orange locations, 
uh, I'm now showing you the plane of the lapse function, the com complexified plane of the lapse function. And so um, in J here, we have the, the paths of steepest descent, and K are the paths of steepest ascent. Now we wanted to evaluate our integral by saying it was defined over Lorentzian metrics. So it was defined by summing over the real line. And as we said earlier, to define this integral now, we have to follow the arrows and just follow the, so the arrows just point up here. And that means that the integral now will actually correspond, be equal to the integral along this steepest descent path J1. That means that only the saddle point one here will actually contribute. And so this means that, um, uh, well, one has to do one additional thing to make sure that this really works is to sh one has to show that these arcs near zero and the arc uh, as you take it off to infinity give zero contribution, but that's actually very easy to show. Um, and also picard lefschetz theory ensures that this happens automatically, but still it's easy to just verify it. Now, I should with this, one can then immediately obtain a value of the path integral because one can just look at the action at that saddle point, at the relevant saddle point, and this is what one finds, right? So this would be the path integral summing from zero size to a large final size Q1, and it gives this particular um, functional form. So there's a, an amplitude, e to the minus 12 pi squared over h bar lambda, and there is a phase, minus i times basically Q1 to the three halves. Now Q1 was the scale factor squared, so Q1 to the three halves really is the scale factor cubed. And so this is just the volume of space time. And so this is what you expect, that the classical part is just the increase in volume. But the interesting part here is the, the, the pre-factor, the amplitude, which now comes out as not as the one that Hartland Hawking had proposed, but as the inverse of that. So Hartland Hawking had proposed e to the plus 12 pi squared over h by lambda. But actually here we see that what one gets is e to the minus 12 pi squared over h by lambda, which is the same as in, in Vilenkin's tunneling wave function proposal, which is very similar to the no boundary proposal. Now, this means that the calculation as it stands does not immediately reproduce the results of Hartland Hawking. Um, but we had no choice in which, uh, which saddle point to choose because picard lefschetz theory tells you just which one is the relevant one. So, um, oh, I should say that also what I was saying earlier that what in, in comparison with the WKB, you see now that there is a constant amplitude, but there is a phase which changes rapidly as the universe expands. And so this means that, that really the universe has become classical as it expands. Right, so what this shows, this already answers one of the questions we had at the beginning, namely, how does the universe become classical? Well, you see that if you have some, if you have vacuum energy that dominates, what it, it means that it will lead to a rapidly changing phase and a, a constant amplitude, and therefore this will, will correspond to a classical space-time at, at, uh, at large values of Q1. And so this makes the universe classical in a way which is not like decoherence, where the coherence already requires that you have matter which is interacting, but here just the dynamics of the scale factor alone makes the universe classical. Now, um, the other thing is that you know we were saying earlier that people used to try to do, define quantum gravity by summing over Euclidean metrics, but here from this we now very clearly see that this is problematic, because if you define along the Euclidean half line, either this up in the upper half plane or in the lower half plane, there's always, it always runs into one of these red regions where the integral is divergent. So the, that means that the Euclidean path integral for, quant, for gravity um, is, is not well defined. Okay, so now we just looked at the background, but in cosmology, we're of course interested in, in perturbations. So we should see what, what does one get for perturbations around this. So here I will just focus on, on tensor perturbations. And uh, there's a standard calculation which shows that if you have a, a, a gravitational wave perturbation with amplitude phi and wave number L, then the action is just this um, at linear order 
I mean, so quadratic in in the action. The uh, the uh, this is the the action for this tensor perturbation, and then one can actually figure out the equation of motion and solve it for these for these perturbations. I'm writing down the solution here, the, um, which you know is is uh, a bit complicated to find, but the but the important point is one can find an explicit um, solution. And so using this explicit solution, one can now also calculate what is the probability for different fluctuations. And here is where there is a, a kind of a surprise that happens, which is that one finds that the amplitude for the fluctuations is given roughly by L cubed. So this is the standard expectation for a scale invariant power spectrum uh, divided by um, the Hubble rate squared. So this is the usual amplitude of the tensor spectrum is just given by by H, uh, and then it gives uh, a factor plus phi one squared, where phi one is the final amplitude. And so this means that one would that instead of getting the expected Gaussian distribution e to the minus phi one squared L cubed over H squared, one gets this with a plus sign. And so this means that these perturbations are in fact unstable. So the universe does not evolve into a smooth universe with small fluctuations, but rather the probability for large fluctuations is higher than the probability for small fluctuations. And so as it stands, this does not work yet. Right? What this means is that really this, um, this summing, this path integral from zero size to a large final size, as defined so far, um, gives unstable perturbations and does not work. Now, there, people have tried many different things to, to, um, to fix this problem. One is to try and modify the contour for the lapse integral, but that typically does not work. Um, because you see, when I go back to, this, to these flow lines here, if you take some other contour in this, in this um, oh, I should say, the, the saddle points, which would have given the weighting that Hartle and Hawking wanted, are these number three and four. Whereas what we got was number one. And, um, but you see, the problem is the following, that if you get number four, say, which is what you would want to get, then you see the path of steepest descent here directly goes to number one. And so if you get number four, this means you get number one in addition, necessarily. You see, if you get number one, you can get number one alone, because the path of steepest descent just goes to the origin and to infinity, and that's it. But if you get number four, the path of steepest descent will automatically include number one. And that means that the, if you get the hartle hawking result with the stable saddle point, you automatically get the the result with the, you automatically get the saddle point with the unstable fluctuations in addition. And so you still have an instability in the system. And the so another thing that people have tried um, is to modify the boundary conditions of the perturbations. But this again does not seem to work because it seems to lead to a large back reaction. So the, the calculation is not really under control. Uh, people have also argued that maybe you should not use the path integral at all, that you should just look at solutions of the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which have, um, which have specific properties that you like. But the trouble is that then you have no idea what you're, in a sense, you don't know what, what the prescription now is for calculating. And because the path integral allows you to specify boundary conditions in a very neat way, if you abandon it, you don't know what you are actually summing over. You don't know what what you, how your theory is in fact defined, but uh, there it turns out there is a resolution of this which I will just mention briefly, um, which is that you see, one can understand the difference between the Hartle-Hawking and the Vilenkin geometry by just saying that this is a different Vick rotation. So in each case you have the Lorentzian de Sitter manifold. But then you have a choice of sign as you Vic rotate to get the Euclidean four sphere part. You can either from the, you know, in a sense, from the green um, classical solution, you can turn right or you can turn left uh, in, in terms of your Vic rotation. 
And yeah. the difference between these two is in fact then whether, so the, these geometries are simply complex conjugates of each other, but the difference is that in one case the perturbations are stable, in the other the perturbations are unstable. The question is, how can we choose one but not get the other? So the problem we had is that if we wanted to get the Hartle-Hawking geometry, we would get the Vilenkin geometry at the same time. And so, um, but what we want is to get only the stable solution. Now, um, this can actually, this is something that we realized recently, is that this is something that can be fixed. Because what we were doing so far is we were just fixing the initial size of the universe to be zero size. Um, but that's not the only possible boundary condition that one can impose. Now, you see, one can think of this Vick rotation as being a particular direction of the initial momentum. Because the initial momentum will be either in one direction or the other direction. And this, this corresponds to this choice of Vick rotation. So if we could specify the initial momentum instead of specifying the initial size of the universe, then, um, then we could fix this problem, right? And one easy way to do this is to use the Einstein-Hilbert action, but add no boundary term at all. So earlier, when I, what I was showing really ha implicitly had the Gibbons-Hawking-York term added, which, makes, which allows you to fix the initial um, value of the fields, right? Because this, if you do this, you get a standard Dirichlet pro problem, variational problem, and this allows you to fix the value of the fields. If you don't add any boundary term, the action still contains this q, q double dot term that normally one does integration by parts on. But now we don't want to do integration by parts because um, we want to keep track of these boundary terms, of these surface terms. If you now vary this action with respect to q, it's a simple exercise to see that actually what you will be able to fix, hold fixed, is not the value of q at t equals zero, but the value of q dot divided by 2n. Unfortunately, on my slide, the dot here has become invisible, but this is what this is saying here is q dot divided by 2n. And now this we can fix to be given by the particular choice of Vick rotation. So it can be i or minus i, depending on which direction you want to Vick rotate in. And so we can fix this now. And if we fix this, then we just pick, we just pick out the, the Hartle-Hawking geometry. And not the Vilenkin geometry, because this, this is not allowed now, because um, it has the wrong Vick rotation. And so if we do this, we now find this particular wave function that now it's given by the amplitude is now e to the plus, 4 pi squared over h bar uh, Hubble rate squared. And now the fluctuation term really is a Gaussian term with a minus sign. So what this means is that with this pres prescription, one can get the Hartle-Hawking wave function, um, but the interpretation of the Hartle-Hawking wave function ha has changed because now we did not sum over universes that start at zero size, but rather we started with universes which have a fixed momentum. But in quantum mechanics, you have the uncertainty principle between field value and momentum. So before we were fixing the field value, which meant that really we were summing over all possible momenta. Now we're fixing the momentum. That means that we're actually summing over all possible initial sizes. So this means that when you specify the Hartle-Hawking wave function, you are specifying a particular Vick rotation and you are not specifying that you are summing over geometries that start at zero size. Right. Um, so the the interpretation that was initially given by Hartle and Hawking, um, in light of these results, sh should be updated. But the result can be obtained. So now we should ask, you know, have we really answered some of the questions which I had at the beginning? Now, some questions have become clearer and some still remain open. Um, one thing is that, you know, as Murray Gellman asked Jim Hartle once, you know, if you know the wave function of the universe, why aren't you rich? Because you know everything. But you see, the wave function of the universe is not that precise. For many things, it will just give you information which is not precise enough to be answer such questions as 
which stocks should you invest in today to be rich next year. Um, but what, what has become clearer is that, you know, quantum cosmology, because of the uh, boundary conditions that you um, impose, it provides restrictions on possible histories. So it restricts the possible solutions. And therefore, it already has the potential of explaining the initial conditions of the universe. Now, um, the, the issue of classicality is interesting because quantum cosmology shows you how the universe can become classical just due to the dynamics of the scale factor and not because of decoherence. Um, and also, you see, as is expected, geometry and matter are treated, and they, I didn't talk about this much, but geometry and matter are treated on the same footing um, in the path integral. And this is as it should be in, in quantum gravity, where now gravity and matter are really interlinked. Moreover, um, these methods which I was showing, this picard lefschetz method, allows you to define a Lorentzian path integral for gravity. And, more, and, and at the same time, it shows that the Euclidean path integral for gravity simply does not exist. So people used it, but they were only using it in heuristic ways and never properly defined it. Now we can see very clearly that it simply does not exist. Now, um, the open questions, is, I think the most important open question is that so far what this is doing, um, also with the no boundary proposal, what this is doing is just reproducing the results of inflation, but it's not really leading to new observational consequences. So one should try to think harder to see if there are any new observational consequences which one could use to test this proposal. And also, everything I showed was in, in toy models where one just considers this mini superspace approximation where one just talks about, just considers the scale factor of the universe, uh, but not the full metric. Even though later we added fluctuations, but they were added as a perturbation of the background. Now, um, it's, it's not completely understood yet to what extent the mini superspace approximation really is a good approximation. This is also something that needs to be, to be uh, clarified in the future. And um, okay, to end, I will just give you a, a couple of references, which there's a, a, a this reference by David Wilcher, which explains the general Wheeler DeWitt setup of quantum cosmology. Uh, Jonathan Halliwell has some lecture notes here, which are more about path integrals and show you how these are constructed in a bit more detail. And I think that for everybody, it's interesting to read the original paper by Stephen Hawking on, on the no boundary proposal because it discusses very generally just this issue of, of initial conditions for the, um, for, for the universe. And this is an, an article which is, which is short and has few equations, but it's very nice to read. And, but it was published in a rather obscure journal of the uh, um, Academy in Rome, the, of the Pope's Academy in Rome. So, um, but I think one can find the paper online. Okay, I would end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, John Luke, for very nice talk. Uh, so, guys, you can ask question whatever you want. Yeah. So, and then, uh, so uh, before that, I have to say that, uh, like, thank you to all of you for attending this excellent talk, and uh, uh, we all thank John Luke for yeah, giving yeah. a very nice talk. So, one clap because of that, and uh, 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 Anjan wants to ask. Yeah, John. Uh, uh, hello, can hello, you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you have said it several times. Just so choosing, choosing people as the point. You have mentioned time and again, but somehow I missed the main point. So, how are you choosing the saddle point, or who is giving the steepest descent? Uh, can you just run through the argument again, in short, uh, uh, if possible? Yes. So, um, let me give you a concrete example. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Okay, so let's say you have this integral here over n. Right. Uh, it has this term n cubed, a term in n, and a term in 1 over n. Right, absolutely. So the saddle point uh, is just the critical point of this. So it's the point where the derivative of this um, expression is zero. Right. So you would just take a, a derivative of this, uh, whatever I have between square brackets here, you take a derivative with respect to n. Yeah. And you set that to zero and you solve. Yeah. So you will get a term, the first term will be n squared lambda squared over 12. Yeah. 
yeah. plus 3 minus lambda over 2qi, right? And then plus 3 over 4n squared q1 okay. squared. And you set that to 0. This is a, now, an, because it has an n squared and a 1 over n squared, you multiply the whole equation by n squared. So then you see it's a fourth order. And right. that's why there are four saddle points. Right. And that's these, these four solutions here. Yeah. Okay, so it's just the the um, the saddle points are just the the local minima or maxima. Um, it's called a saddle point because in the complex integral, because it's a complex integral, and if you have a complex function which you expand around a um, which you expand around a, a critical point. Right, so the function is a constant, but then the next the next contribution will be a contribution in say z squared because the the linear term will disappear because it's because you said it's a it's a critical point. Yes. Right. Yes. But now if you add z squared and you write z as x plus i y, you see this has contains x squared minus y squared. That means that in the x direction it will be a minimum, and in the y direction it will be a maximum. So if you have a, a critical point of a complex function, it's automatically a saddle point. That's why it, people always say saddle point. But if you now look at just the critical point here of the Morse function n here, well, for if you imagine n is real, then it would just be, of course, uh, uh, either a maximum or a minimum. Right. Yeah. But because so, we, yeah. 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 So the uh, next step of choosing the particular saddle point which will contribute to the integral. That part I'm asking. Possibly I've asked the wrong question. So sorry for that. So the next part. So how are you choosing the saddle point which will contribute to the integral? Ah. Um, so again, let me give you the example here. The idea was that we want to. The, the integral is defined here over the real line. Right. Say, say from there's a zero. The zero is here in the middle. Say that the integral is defined from zero to infinity. Right. Now, um, but along this line, the integral is highly oscillating. Right. And it's only conditionally convergent. But now you follow the uh, arrows of steepest descent. And then you, you can deform okay. this line into this dashed orange line. Okay. Right? Because you just follow, you just go down in the integrand. And then this is... By Cauchy's theorem, these are equivalent. And so you find the, the appropriate steepest descent contour by, by just following the arrows, but just going flowing down, uh, in just, just following the arrows in the steepest descent direction. And now this steepest descent contour J1 then passes through the saddle point 1, and therefore this is, this is the relevant saddle point. So what about the other side? Means the J two and I think this. Um, yeah. So the other saddle points they exist, but they are not relevant for this integral. They they are simply not relevant for this integral, right? It means that you can have saddle points which are not which are not uh, which are irrelevant. That's why just using a saddle point approximation is not enough because you have to make sure that you know whether or not this saddle point is really relevant or not. Yeah, uh, so uh, so that's what my question was. So, so how are you choosing the relevance of a particular saddle point? You are choosing the saddle point on the uh, positive x-axis or say the positive axis, mm -hmm. but uh, on the negative side there is also a saddle point. So how are you eliminating that? On what on what basis you are uh, leaving out? So you have to define the original integration contour of your integral. Oh, Here it's defined okay. to just run from zero to infinity along the positive real axis. Okay. Once this okay. is fixed, once this is fixed, it's then only the saddle point one will will contribute. Let's yes. imagine. Imagine I had defined the integral on the negative real line. Imagine then, uh, just then it would be saddle point two that contributes. Okay, okay. I got that one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So Thank it depends you. on how you define it. Okay. Okay. But your, the thing is that your original integral must be well defined. So I was saying that, uh, giving the example where you try to give a Euclidean definition here. Yes. But you see, the problem with this definition is that it runs into this red region where the integral just diverges. Right. right. So this is a this would be a meaningless integral. Mathematically, right. it would have no no meaning. Right. 
Yes. Right. So, so you cannot. So you have to. So you can start with any contour you like, but it has to be well defined, and then you can deform it using Picard Lefschetz theory into a sum of steepest descent paths. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Nitin, you have any questions? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, please ask. So uh, my question is like actually very very uh, elementary. So it's like uh, what we are doing is we are taking an action and sort of uh, minimizing it, right? Well, um, extremizing it, I would say, yes. Yeah, yeah extremizing. So uh, instead of using the picard lifshitz theory, which seems a bit complicated, can we not use like, uh, can we not treat this as a machine learning problem and just throw some numbers it, at it and uh, extract our information from there? That would also make it non-perturbative and exact answers. Um, let's see. What do you? Sorry, can you repeat? What in what sense yeah. it would make it? A, how would you make it a machine learning problem? So, what I mean is that uh, uh, we have our contours defined here, right? Hello. Yes. Yeah. So we have our contours defined here, and we have our yes. action as well. So, yes. uh, can we just throw some data points at this problem? by like i mean the uh, steeper descent method that is basically a machine learning algorithm right um, so I, can we not use a computer to solve this problem well i mean i uh, i did use a computer to find the steepest descent paths uh, but I mean, uh, this is very uh, quick to find you don't need to do machine learning for that because you can use the state the property that they have stationary phase yeah um, now I yes, I'm not sure if if this is because from machine learning you need many data points to to learn first from from those, right? To to train your algorithm. Yeah. And I don't know how you would obtain this here, right? So I think that it's um, when I, I have I, I don't know I have to think about that because it, I mean the, the the example which I was just which I gave you here is simple enough that it's actually easier to just do it directly, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But of That's course, my... now, if you imagine an action which is more complicated and where we yeah. cannot solve the integral, yes, then it gets exactly. more difficult. Um, so in that case, we'll be making some approximations and getting some approximations. Yeah, I don't know if, if machine learning so is instead we can use. Learning. But you see, the, okay. there should be, in general, if you never have a more complicated path integral, there will the, the steepest descent paths will not be one dimensional, but will be higher dimensional because you have many variables. Yeah, yeah. And so what you would need to do is now in this higher dimensional space, you would have to find, follow the, the directions of descent. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that is something that could be usefully done with a computer. Exactly. Right. But yeah, I don't know if it's a machine learning uh, problem or if it's just a matter of finding the correct ways of, of, of setting up the flow and then following the yeah, flow. Yeah, basically that's what I mean. I mean, yeah. I the wrong words. Yes, yeah, I, I think that would be, yes. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, there, is, there is one paper by Neil Trorok and his student, Joop Feldborger, who the two people who I have also work, been working with here, where they have tried this for some um, path integrals that arise in astronomy, and where I think they have tried to do this in, in two dimensions. Um, so this is something that you could could try to look at. Uh, but I yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's so, uh, yeah there, there should definitely be applications for this. Yeah. So I have one more thing. Like there is this no boundary proposal, right? Mm -hmm. So. so uh, is it somehow like uh, related to the cyclic thing? Because it seems that uh, if uh, it if the universe sprang out from nothing, then it's going to keep cycling, right? Mm, no, I think the idea in the cyclic universe was really that there is no beginning, that that there were infinite numbers of cycles. At least okay. that's in some and... versions of the cyclic universe, that would be the case. You can also imagine a cyclic universe which starts at some point and then has cycles afterwards. And then that's that yeah, yeah. should again be described by the no boundary proposal. Uh, 
but uh -huh. uh, the okay. two ideas are not directly related i mean you can you can combine them but you don't have to okay yeah sure okay so yeah that's it for me thank you you're welcome Aren't you have any question no good um, uh, i have one question that uh, like in uh, uh, like modern day cosmology we mostly study correlations okay yes. so this idea of wave function uh, in the lorentzian signature can be uh, connected to this kind of correlation business as well yeah well here the correlations are for perturbations yeah and yeah what I was looking at here more was really the background itself and also the interaction of the background and the fluctuations. Okay. And this is something which in the approach of just of looking at correlations, you would not see. Okay. Uh, because because you there you keep the background fixed. But uh, if you yeah. describe the, the beginning of the universe, you have to also explain where the background comes from. Right. And that's that's. But that would be possible to calculate this correlation if we don't fix the background and from the starting point we assume that uh, it's it, it, it's uh, like itself some quantum signature is there or something like that. I, I don't know. I mean, it it it. Uh, I mean, you can only calculate correlations of fluctuations if the background is already known. Yeah. But the idea here is to figure out what should be the appropriate background. Okay, okay. Uh, John, I have one more question. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. So this is in context of Shantan's talk, which Shantan was uh, giving a talk at ISC. So mm -hmm. somebody asked, I also felt it interesting, that somebody asked that we are, more often or not, we are dealing with the classical theory of perturbations. Mm -hmm. But here we have explicitly talked about the quantum theory of perturbation on which Mukhanag has also uh, did something, I think you must be aware about. Of. So I was I just wondering, I think the same guy asked the same question, that with how to connect this quantum theory of perturbations with the classical approach which you usually adopt in treating these tensor perturbations or say scalar perturbations. So, so can you just comment on it? So I just want you to comment on that. Well, the perturbations, they, they are really quantum. I mean, they, they start in, in the quantum state. And in fact, here, the no boundary proposal would give the, the bunch, would automatically imply the bunch Davies state for the perturbations. Yes. And then, you know, they are in this state, but they, they can, uh, the perturbations, they become effectively classical. I mean, they are really quantum, but they become effectively more and more classical because they, they, they turn into this highly squeezed state. Inflation makes them highly squeezed, which means that the uncertainty in the momentum becomes very, very extremely small, but the uncertainty in the amplitude becomes large. Okay. And so really what this means is that they get frozen in. Uh, you know, this, the fact that the uncertainty becomes small in the momentum is a reflection of the fact that, that when people say perturbations get frozen when they cross the horizon, that's, that's what they say. That's what it means. Oh. Okay. And, but the fact that you have this, this large uncertainty in the amplitude means that now, if you have many such fluctuations, it becomes equivalent to a statistical distribution of classical fluctuations. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Right? And, and so, in that sense, the perturbations are becoming effectively classical. Okay. Well, so can we just give me a yeah. reference on the squeeze state? Uh, yeah, so, so can you just give me a reference on the squeeze state, which you have just mentioned, because uh, I'm not aware. Yeah, I'm trying to think. There are, there are several papers about this. Uh, there is an, an early paper is by Albrecht and um, um, let's see. Um, so I'm if you put the reference, just send it to me. I will pass them. Okay. I can I can tell you where you can find them. So I I wrote a paper with Lorenzo Batara yeah. uh, on on how. Uh, perturbations become classical in aquarotic models. And, uh, but in that paper, we give the list of references of all the papers where people have done this for inflationary models. So if okay. you look in the list of references of that paper, okay. uh, I think the paper was called uh, the, the Quantum to Classical Transition for Aquarotic Perturbations. It must be about five years old or so, the paper. Okay, okay I'll find it out. 
Uh, if you look around, yeah, 2014 or something, I would guess. Okay. And if you look in the list of references, you will see there's also a good paper by Starobinsky and collaborators uh, okay. on this. Uh, so, yeah, that that, I ha that should have useful references there. Okay, okay. I'll look into it. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. So thank you for giving an excellent talk and it will be really useful for all the students and uh, like uh, really nice. Well, so you're welcome. Thank uh, you for listening. Yeah, no, no, it's really nice. Thank you, sir. <laughs> not, not, it, it's really nice, actually. So uh, I'm start. Uh, so I'm stopping the recording. Okay. Uh, okay.